I can hack into your Firebase app in about 10 seconds, then steal and delete all your data, assuming you fail to set up backend security rules. Allow me to show you. All I have to do is pull up an app and go into the Chrome Developer Tools under the Network tab, then find a request coming from Firebase, open up the headers, and find the corresponding project ID. From there, I can just go to the command line and run a curl delete request to the Firebase REST API and start wiping out this app's database. If you deploy a Firebase app without backend rules, anybody can do this to your app as well. Today, I'm going to show you how to keep your Firestore database secure by writing expressive, easy to understand backend security rules. If you're new here, like and subscribe and grab the source code from angularfirebase.com. To get started, you'll want to go to the Firestore database and then open up the rules tab. Rules are defined in their own special language that somewhat resembles JavaScript. Currently, the arrow is pointing to the root of our database, and all of our rules logic will be defined inside this block. Then we use the match keyword to point to paths in our database where we want to apply rules. In this case, we're using the equals star star to match every single document in the database. Then we use the allow keyword, followed by the operation that we want to set a rule for, in this case, read or write. If we leave it blank, it's going to allow those operations, or we can write an expression that returns true or false to apply some actual rule logic to this route. For example, if we wanted to completely lock down all documents, we could say if false, and then nobody could read or write from the client side. If I try to query a collection from my front end app, I'm going to get an error in the browser console. So cool, now our app's 100% secure, but that's a little too secure. Now we're going to write some rules that perform logic based on user authentication, the underlying data, the incoming request time, etc. First, let's look at the various types of requests that we can lock down. First, we have get, which would apply to reading a specific document. Then list would apply to a collection query. So those are our read rules. Then our write rules, we have create, which applies to creating new data, update for modifying existing data, and delete for removing data. In addition, we could say allow read, which would just combine get and list, or we could also say allow write, which would combine create, update, delete into a single rule. So that's how we scope rules to specific operations. Now I want to show you how to point to the actual data that we want to apply these rules to. The first thing to make note of is the equal star star. That special syntax is going to tell your rules to cascade down to all subcollections and anything nested under that path. That's useful when you have a rule that's applied to many different collections, such as verifying a user is authenticated. You can also make your rules very specific. For example, we can point to a specific document using the document ID. All you have to do is hard code it directly into the path and then write the corresponding rules. That can be useful sometimes, but the single most useful matcher is the wildcard ID. Instead of hard coding the ID, we just add brackets with a variable name that we can evaluate as the ID at runtime. By setting product ID right here, we can use that as a variable that represents the document ID. Then we can evaluate that ID in the actual allow statement, which we'll see in action here throughout the lesson. And the wildcard is by far the most common matcher that you're going to be using throughout your backend rules. I'd also like to point out that your rules are secure by default. So unless you explicitly allow an operation, it's going to be blocked by Firestore. In my demo here, I'm allowing the user to read the documents, but only delete a document if they are logged in. We can figure that out by looking at the request object that is built into the rules environment. The request object is very important, and for one, it gives us information about the current user. To simply see if a user is logged in, we can see if the request auth does not equal null. So that's pretty cool, but the thing I don't like about it is that it doesn't read very well. That brings me to my favorite part of Firestore rules, and that's the ability to write your own custom functions. Functions allow us to repurpose our rules in a way that's dry and readable. So instead of writing if request auth does not equal null a whole bunch of times, I'm going to write a function called is signed in. The function will just return the request auth does not equal null statement, then we can replace it on the allow line, and now it just reads like a plain English sentence that anybody can understand. Allow delete if signed in. Pretty simple. My goal from here on out is to give you a bunch of helper functions that you can easily reuse in your own project. The next thing we might want to do is determine whether or not a user is the owner of a certain document. A good example might be a user profile where all users can read other users' profiles, but only the owner can write to it. So here we're matching the user's user ID document 
and allowing read if they're signed in, but only allowing write if they're the owner user. And notice how we're passing the wildcard variable to the argument in our function. For this to work, it's important that the document ID matches the user ID. And if you've seen my authentication tutorials, you'll know how to do that. Then when defining this function, all we have to do is look at the auth user ID on the request and compare it to the user ID on that document that we passed as the argument. If the IDs are the same, then we know that the current user is the owner of this document. And we can actually get a lot more sophisticated. Let's say we want to determine whether or not a user has a verified email. I'm going to use an AND statement to chain another function to our rule. With an AND statement, both functions will need to return true for this rule to pass. You can also chain things together with an OR statement to check if only one of the conditions is true. But in this case, we want to make sure the user is the owner and that they have a verified email. Like I mentioned before, the request object has all kinds of useful information. In this case, we're going to look at the token on the auth object that contains an email verified property of true or false. We could also see when a user signed up, if they're anonymous, if they have a phone number, to compose all kinds of other useful rules. But another common thing you'll need in your rules is to know what the existing data looks like as compared to the incoming data. To get the existing data, you can use the resource keyword followed by data, but try not to confuse that with request resource data. I recommend writing functions as existing data and incoming data just to make this very explicit and clear because these are easy to mix up. And it's really important that you don't mess up your backend rules. So when might you need existing data? A common use case would be if you have a certain document that maybe gets locked after it's published. If we jump up to the products path, we can look at the existing product document and we'll make sure that it's not locked before running the update. Checking existing data is usually most important when your users can control whether or not a document should be modified at some point. When it comes to incoming data, there's all kinds of validation rules that we can apply to our underlying data structure. Let's imagine that our product document must have a price of greater than $10. So if the user tries to send an update where the price is less than $10, we're going to cause this update to fail. So looking at the incoming data is very important for maintaining the integrity of your database. Now switching gears, in episode 75 I talked about role-based user authorization, and I want to revisit some of those concepts now. In that lesson we saved information about the user's role on their user document, and we need to read that document when applying a rule to various parts of the database. This document's not going to be available on the user object, so we're going to need a different mechanism to read the document whenever needed. The rules environment has a get keyword that will read a document by pointing to a specific path. We need to use the absolute path, so this gets pretty verbose. But if you put it into a function, then it's not too bad. We write out the path like normal, and then use dollar sign parentheses and interpolate the request auth user ID. This gives us the current user's document in Firestore, which contains information about their authorized roles. Now let's use this function to authorize a user to update a product. We can read the document, and then we have an object of roles, so we can get all of the keys from that object by calling keys on it, then has any will check if the user has any of these authorized roles, such as editor or admin. You could also use has all to make sure that the user has all of these roles. At the end of the day, that gives you a very simple solution for implementing role-based user authorization. Another interesting thing to think about is how time impacts your database security. A common scenario is to throttle the amount of data that a user can create during a certain duration of time. We can get the current time of any request by just calling request time. Then there's a duration helper that we can use to operate on the timestamp. For example, we want to make sure the request time comes after the created at timestamp plus a duration of 60 seconds. In other words, the user can only write to a product document every 60 seconds. So duration just allows you to add a number of seconds, minutes, or hours and compare them to a Firestore timestamp. I'm going to go ahead and wrap up there. Hopefully this helps you avoid becoming the next major data breach victim. If this video helped you, please like and subscribe. And if you're ready to take things to the next level, consider becoming a pro subscriber at angularfirebase.com. You'll get a whole bunch of exclusive content and direct access to chat with me on Slack. Thanks for watching and I'll see you soon.